my talk call. My name is Ihilani Kamal, and today I will be talking about my project um, that focuses on predicting um, sea level rise impacts to coastal wastewater infrastructures and water quality. So before I want to start, I want to talk about, um, to point out my team members too that have helped me throughout this project. So um, Dr. Tracy Wagner, Dr. Stephen Colbert right there, and Dr. Lisa Mer Merrick. They have been my mentors who have helped me throughout this project. And um, below is all of the different um, organizations who have also made this project possible. So sea level rise, we know that sea level rise is an issue and um, especially here in Hawaii. So with the increase in storm surges and floods, um, sea level rise will increase storm surges and flood, floods intensities. And by the year 2100, it is expected to rise 0.3 to one meters. And that will cost billions of do dollars in destructions for a lot of um, coastal infrastructures specifically. So here are some, um, here's one of the infrastructures that will be impacted by sea level rise is on-site sewage disposal systems, also known as OSDS. And these will be highly impacted by sea level rise because um, they're typically, typically located along the coastline in order to minimize the cost of collecting the water and discharging the treated effluent. So just their loca location itself makes them highly susceptible to coastal flooding. And with that, um, there will be impacts. Um, the leaking of that effluent into the near shore waters will um, impact future water quality. So um, sewage effluent can impact both the human health as well as the ecosystems. So for human health, being exposed to the sewage um, polluted waters can lead to gastroenteritis, um, rashes, skin, urinary tract, and respiratory infections. Um, specifically for the ecosystem, this effluent water being released into near shore waters can create um, excess nutrients. And this excess nutrients can lead to harmful algal blooms and also increased bioerosion. The toxins within the sewage um, effluent can also increase coral diseases and reduce the recovery rates of corals that are already bleached. So specifically here in Hawaii, cesspools are a primary means for sewage, um, for sewage disposal. And Hawaii is actually the last state in the U.S. to ban cesspools. So there are approximately 88,000 cesspools um, throughout the state of Hawaii. So a few of the goals of this project, um, before we want to get into the project, a few of the goals is to assess, assess potential water quality impacts of sea level rise in the future based on the current water quality conditions. Um, the second one is to document and identify sewage pollution hotspots along the Kailua Kona shoreline. And our third goal is to determine which coastal wastewater on-site sewage disposal systems and wastewater treatment plant infrastructures will be affected by sea level rise um, under different projections. So the study site for this project is Kailua Kona. Uh, it is known for a place for tourism. There's a lot of canoe paddling events there and marathon events. The site is also significant because there are many cultural sites along that shoreline, Hulihe'e Palace, for example. And within that shoreline, there's approximately 6,500 um, coastal cesspools. So within that area, there's 15 megaliters per day of um, untreated sewage effluent being discharged into the coastal waters. And that makes um, Kailua Kona just a priority area, a priority level one, and the second highest um, nutrient um, second highest concentration on Hawaii Island. So in order to achieve the goals um, set in this project, we took a multi-indicator approach in order to identify and um, more and better identify sewage pollution within the areas. So we did we used fecal indicated bacteria, also known as FIB, and we looked at the pathogens. So for fecal indicated bacteria, we used enter um, we looked at the Enterococcus and Clostridium perforans, and then for the pathogens, we just um, looked at Staph and MRSA. So for the staff in MRSA, we collected um, data from six out of the 12 stations that we had, and um, only for 
a time period of three months. And then for the nutrient concentrations, um, those are, these are the nutrient concentrations within the water and those are all the nutrients that we tested for. And then for the macroalgae nitrate analysis, we, um, that was based on the lingo that we collected in order to um, better understand where the nitrate sources are coming from. And all of these different um, indicators were used together in order to better detect sewage pollution at each of the stations. So 12 stations were selected for my project um, along the shoreline from Kailua Pier to Keaho. Um, these stations were selected based on having the lowest salinity. So the lowest salinity was important because those are areas where groundwater is um, flowing out from and groundwater can also be a carrier of the effluent to the near shore waters. Stations were also selected based on accessibility because each month we'd have to go back to these stations and it was important that we'd be able to access them easily to get through all the stations. And then we also selected them based on having a significance to the community. Um, some places like Kahalu'u, they already had community members collecting data from certain stations, so they pointed out areas where we could possibly collect more data from. And number four is areas where solution, um, sewage pollution is already a concern. At each of the 12 stations, we made sure to um, record the physiochemical parameters. So that included the temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. And we also collected water samples at each of the stations. And that, those water samples was going to be processed for um, the bacteria, nutrients in the water, um, the turbidity, and pH. So for a fecal indicating bacteria, uh, we had Clostridium and Enterococcus, and both of these bacteria um, were used as our, as our indicator bacteria because they're found in the intestinal tracts of both humans and animals, and they're commonly used as, a indi um, as an indicator for fecal contamination. And then for pathogens, we looked at Staph and MRSA. For our macroalgae analysis, at each of the 12 stations, lingual was collected, and um, this lingual was dried, was rinsed, dried, and processed in order to look at the nitrate within the lingual samples. And this nitrate would help us determine whether the sources were coming from actual sewage pollution or if the source of that nitrate was fertilizers or other sources. And um, we also took tide measurements using a pressure logger. So we placed three pressure loggers into three ankyline ponds um, for three months. And the data and those pressure loggers recorded the rise and fall of the water. <coughs> and here you can see Lisa Merrick, who is a part of my committee, and she's using that data to actually create a sea level rise model. And that will um, later tie into my project um, along with my data of the current conditions of, sea level, um, of sewage pollution. So here are some results of the project so far. Here is the entire caucus data that we've collected. Um, on the x-axis we have all the stations and the y-axis is the entire caucus concentrations. So the gray line is the Hawaii Department of Health standard for entire caucus. And then the red line above is the Hawaii Department of Health Beach Action Value. So basically, um, areas where it is hitting the beach action value, that means that um, those are times where they would close down the beaches because the entire caucus concentrations are very high. So those are really important to look at. And here we can see that all of the stations occasionally exceed the geometric mean of 35 MPN. However, six out of the 12 stations, like you can see that they regularly exceed it or are close to exceeding that beach action value of 130. And here's our clostridium data. Um, so the standard that we looked at was, came from Fujioka and it was the recommended standard for Hawaiian coastal waters. And here you can see that none of the stations are really close to that. Um, standard, and they don't uh, exceed that recommended standard of 5 um, CFU. So for clostridium, our data 
it was it was pretty good to see that um, it wasn't really high for these stations. And here is our staff data. So as I said earlier, we collected the staff, um, staff and MRSA at six out of the 12 stations. And so these six stations had the lowest salinity overall. And this standard comes from Favero um, for their pool standard of staff, and it's at 100 CFU. And you can see that only several stations had a mean concentrations above that recommended pool standard. Um, and for the MRSA part of this, none of this, um, no MRSA was detected at any of the six stations where we tested for. So in conclusion, based on the data that we have collected so far, um, sewage pollution has been detected in Kailua Kona. So based on the enterococcus, we could see that often, um, the enterococcus data often exceeded the H2H standard. Um, so later on, when we get more da data back from the lab, we'll be able to analyze the other samples and the nutrients um, that we've collected and see how that relates to sewage pollution. For, for the second point, um, we have our data helps us to like figure out plans or adaptation plans that need to be taken um, in order to predict, um, prepare for future sea level rise. So we um, adaptation plans need to be put in place in order to remove, relocate, or convert OSDS that are um, that are that will be inundated due to sea level rise. And also that the results of this project will be able to share with the community. So although we, only have, we don't have a lot of our information back yet, um, the data that we have collected so far, like doing presentations like this to keep people updated will be helpful. But in the future, we hope to share all of the results with the community members and the county so that actions can be taken. So what's next? Um, for this project, we're still in the process of creating a sea level rise model. Um, using the pressure logger data that we have collected, as well as the OSDS data from the state. Um, we are in the process of planning for a dye tracer test in order to document the connections between the OSDS and the coastal waters. Um, we'll also be creating a sewage pollution score to um, better detect areas where sewage pollution is a higher concern. Um, we will be determining which OSDS should be prioritized for conversion and for setbacks for the sewer line. And then our final, um, well not our final, but the uh, last thing that we'll probably be doing is making predictions for the future water quality um, under different sea level rise um, scenarios. So with the data that we have collected so far, we will be able to um, use that tied into the sea level rise models in order to make predictions of the future and come up with plans to better prepare for that. Um, Mahalo nui loa to everybody for listening today to my talk and also to everybody who have helped me in the field um, make this project possible. So we have time for a question, maybe one question from the audience. Anybody? No? Okay, go ahead. Hey, Mark, can you tell us a little bit about your interactions with the community uh, regarding how you've shared this information? Yes, yeah, so, um, well, to start off about, uh, since you brought up the topic of community, um, this whole project was actually initiated by community members. They reached out wanting to um, get more information because they have seen things that could have been indication of sewage pollution. So they reached out asking for some help um, collecting this data. And as for sharing like the data that I've had so far, I've been actually in communication with a few people from the Kohala Center, Anti Cindy Punihale and Kathleen Clark. Um, and also I had meetings with county members to make sure that they're up to date with um, what we have been talking about with our project and our current results. And we've been meeting with them just to ensure that they know what we've been up to and um, to make sure that if they have anything to add or any feedback for us to continue our project, that we'll be able to get that and add that into our project um, early on throughout our stages. So I think for, um, 
for communicating with the community is really important part of this project and I've just it's been great to actually like meet up with them and meet up with certain people and um, hear what they have to say about our project and he hear like how they think like we should continue on with it so yeah thank you, thank you.